Welcome back to the Forensics Detailing Channel, BMW E36 328i Sport, BMW E46 330Ci Club Sport, or just a CI, we're talking about essentially the same thing. You can own either of these two cars for a relatively small amount of money. They are modern classics, they are iconic, they're getting on a bit. In this video, we're gonna talk and review stop. both cars and then tell you about which one of the two you should get. Okay, guys, first thing, 328i E36. Let's talk about prices. Now, I said there's about 500 of these left on the road, but a lot of those are automatic and convertibles and everyone wants the manual hard tops and, and perhaps even without the sunroof. So perhaps less than 250, I'm not sure exactly, are these on the road. So they're quite hard to get hold of. And that's driving the prices up. So if you want basically a bottom of market one, you're gonna be paying three to four grand. Um, and then when you start getting above five grand, you might find decent in order examples with MOTs, drivable with a few minor niggles, usually a bit of rust in the rear arches. So that's sort of five to six grand. And then when you go north of six grand, you start getting the tidy ones, perhaps lower mileage. Um, all the way up to 10 grand and there's even some really con concourse ones that are probably not concourse that are north of 10 grand so I've paid over six grand for this which is more than I wanted to pay but the condition is kind of okay I don't have any errors or niggles and most of the things were minor things that I could fix myself um, mainly it's for enjoyment though guys so that's price of the 328 the next thing is I want to talk about the engine so you have this kind of inline six cylinder m52 engine which i don't know that much about but you know you've got to work on the engines really to know a little bit about them and own a few cars all i can say about this engine is the throttle response seems restricted um there isn't that, that instant power there you can see it's a slow build up and it's not a free revving engine as soon as you come off that throttle you know the build-up of revs is quite restricted and as soon as you come off the throttle it stops whereas other cars are a bit more free flowing with the rev counter and the throttle response is a little bit better now people say you can mess around with the engine put a uh, put the uh is it the m50 um plastic air intake on there to allow more air into the the engine and that makes it a bit more free flowing and increases power i may well do that but i didn't buy this car with 192 brake horsepower because I thought it was ever going to be fast but yeah there's there is an issue with a quite a sluggish restricted throttle response on these cars although when you get into the revs and rev through them they drive nice and I just it's an empty deserted road the speed limit is 60 I'm going to take it up to the speed limit and um, you can see what I mean about the revs I'm not flat out because it's wet Yeah, there's the speed limit it's not slow this car and I like I like having to push it <laughs> having to whip it to get the speed out of it but I never I don't drive this car too aggressively because I just consider it I don't consider it a fast car so that's the engine side covered brakes they're okay um, they they're average is what I'd say. You, you haven't got a big braking system on this. You didn't tend to get that, that on these older cars. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you can, if you take this, they've got stock standard pads on them. If I took that to a track, that's where you find out really if your pads are okay. And, um, you know, the two things you want to tend to up, upgrade, your pads and your brake fluid so you don't overheat your brake fluid and lose the pedal completely. But for the road, I'm just going to do a stop because the road is deserted. Jesus, that didn't sound too good. <laughs> the anti-lock brakes obviously kicked in there, uh, but you can stop the car if you need to, and it's balanced. Next thing, guys, one of the real positives of this is the steering. So even on this old car, the steering, so first of all, it's tracking perfectly, and just the slightest adjustment, there's no play in the steering wheel at all on this car. The, the rack is a little bit on the slow side, the steering wheel is a little bit on the big side, and slightly narrow to hold, which is one thing I'm not overly keen on. But when you're actually driving the car at speed, the steering feels really, really good. Um, 
Oh, careful here. Right, this is a dangerous corner. <laughs> Jesus. Right, let's give it a blast. Doesn't that feel nice? And that's the speed limit. <laughs> I mean, you hit the speed limit still in seconds, you know. So it feels, you can enjoy revving the car a little bit more with this. So, steering feel is great, guys, especially on really windy corners when you're you're sort of leaning on the car. That lead, leads us on to the next thing about this car, which I love, and that is the balance and the handling. The balance of this car is amazing. You can turn the traction control off, really lean it into a corner and put, feed on the power. And when, obviously on the roads, you know, it's harder to get on that limit. I would like to put, put this car around a track to kind of feel it more, but it just feels so well planted. I know it's a cliche, but the balance of the car is phenomenal, especially when you overcook it and then you find out, you know, really how good your car is. Um, and I, that is the number one thing about this car is the balance and the way you can control the kind of back end through the throttle, even though you have to give it a bit more because that throttle response, that throttle response is sluggish. You have to kind of go bananas with the, the throttle pedal and be really aggressive with it. But that's the best thing. Suspension, well, I don't have stock suspension on this car. I have the HSD uh, coilovers. Um, they were set up wrong. I had three of them on the hardest sort of setting and one of them on the softest. So the ride was horrible when I did the first drive on this. And some of you were commenting about the steering wheel saying, there's something wrong with your steering on your car, John. Nothing wrong with the steering wheel. It doesn't move at all. It's perfect. It was probably just a suspension throwing it and me just moving my arm. It's it's absolutely perfect. It's the best thing on the car. Um, but I've sorted that suspension, raised the rise, ride height up a bit and softened it off. It's still quite a stiff suspension setup. Ideal for track, just about usable for roads. Next thing is, guys, the interior. I, this is another massive strength for me on this car. Like the interior feels really nice quality. I said before, there's no delaminating surfaces. It's probably a better quality interior with the exception of the headlining coming out and the, the paint coming off the leather, which is a bit of a problem. It's a, probably a better quality interior than um, the E46 that we're gonna talk about later on. I love the gear change on this car as well. It just, it's, re it's less rubbery than the E36. So let's, we've got a beautiful straight road here, guys. Look at this. So we're gonna give it a little bit of gas, try and I'm just gonna to stay to the speed limit as well. Well, I'm, you know, obviously. Um, and apologies for the fluctuating light on the main camera. I'll try and sort that out in a second. spot there. <laughs> Dogging spot. Oh god. Okay. Oop. In kicks the traction control. This road is epic. I'm lucky that just north of where I live, some phenomenal roads, like you can see them now, hopefully. I'm trying to drive like this so you can actually see the road. Just phenomenal. Countryside, nobody around. So I wanna move on to a subject matter of like power and performance, like, and why I'm driving around in these old cars and why I love them so much. I said when I sold my M140, it was too quick, ridiculously quick, because to me, part of the enjoyment of driving the car is being on the throttle and experiencing the acceleration. But the problem is the power, there was so much power in that car. When you're experiencing the acceleration, you get up to beyond the speed limit and the dangerous speeds in, you know, in small amounts of time and you don't get enough time to enjoy the ride. Um, so it's not about how fast you're going on a road. You can never explore 
like the limit of your car's performance on a road because the roads are greasy, they're wet, they're bubbly, there's cyclists everywhere, there's other cars. And if you do, you'll end up dead or you'll end up killing someone very, very rapidly. So really, what I'm looking for is a car that I can enjoy going through the gears and revving without going at ludicrous speeds. And this six cylinder engine, even though it's restricted, still has that power there on tap, you know, that, that kick. Um, so this car is just about the right level of performance for me. And I don't want all the electronics in the car as well, guys. I, I like a simple kind of car. Yes, this has the ASC system in there, but you can turn it off just with a press of a button, gone. Um, and really you're just experiencing a pure kind of mechanical drive of, you know, there's, no elect there's less electronics involved. I've got a hydraulic rack, so I can feel what's going on. Again, with the M140 and the modern BMWs, the electric rack is, is, is good in some ways if you're having this car as a daily driver. The lack of feedback is kind of quite nice. It makes us for a smoother experience. But when you want to enjoy the car, you want all these kind of you want all your sensations to be triggered. So you want, a, you want a bit of feedback from the steering wheel. You want a bit of noise from the engine. You want to be able to feel the car kind of underneath you. I know these all sound like cliches, but they're things that you get with old cars. Whereas the new cars, some of those things are taken away from you. Uh, so again, with the manual as well, that just adds that dimension that you're actually doing a bit more driving rather than take away the, the manual gearbox, take away the, the hydraulic um, rack, you know, and you've really, it's like you've lost sort of sensation to your legs and they're just there kind of working, but they're numb. Um, you need to feel them. You need to feel the aches in your calves, the twitches in your feet, the tingles, the aches in your knee. All those things are what make life <laughs> make life more interesting I'm veering into the the realms of bullshit here so <laughs> but you know what I mean so basically you get to experience all the things that you want to experience when you're driving in these old cars and it should it shouldn't be complicated it should just be simple and it's very simple a bit of acceleration a bit of handling a bit of feedback I do not need to be pulling sub four second naught to 60 times. <laughs> there was a time, don't get me wrong, back in my twenties, we all want that power and the speed, but once you've had it, you realize it's a little bit silly and the arms race for uh, you know performance is just getting ridiculous now. I also want rear wheel drive. Oh, that's what it's all about, guys. The roar of the engine, the open road, and I am a lucky boy. Come down here on a Sunday morning and um, you can still get, you know, some free roads. You're basically competing with dog walkers, um, people going walking, which is good, and cyclists. So we're just go coming up to Goodwood Racetrack now. the rest of the journey with the indicator on. Loose statement it wasn't right there. Dick, 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 dick. Eventually it clicks in, you've left something on. Getting old. Right, let's turn this traction control back on. What are these cars like in terms of reliability? Um, well, <laughs> every time I turn this on, the traction control light, warning light, may or may not come on. Today it's playing ball, I've got no errors, it's running great. I just fixed the throttle actuator cable, which was damaged. I shouldn't turn the traction control off then. There's a big bump here. <laughs> there it is. You got this big bump. Here it comes. Yeah, I think it, I think that was it. Yeah. Hit that at speed. Not good. Um, yeah, reliability. So 
because it's an old car, the engine gets very hot. Some of the components in that engine, it's not a simple engine. There's lots of little peripheral things going on, especially that ASC system. I had a problem the other day, I'm just driving it and I hit five and a half thousand revs and it just hit a rev limiter that wasn't there before and I thought, oh, something's gone here. What the hell's this? And then that, that problem's never come back. Um, so I don't know, I've got this intermittent problem with the traction control warning light come on, which I think is something to do with the boot lid, the brake boot lid. It's got some sort of loose connection still. So there's a few little niggles there. Rust is a bit of a problem on these cars. My rear arches have got a bit of rust on them. My subframe, rear subframe's a bit crusty, but it's a 19, it's a 22 year old car. Um, you know, it'd be nice if they didn't have those rust issues, but they do. So you're gonna have niggles to keep on top of. Parts can be a bit of an issue with this car. You're reliant on breakers as well, more so than the E46. So look at these amazing roads, guys. You can just pop the car down. And stop. Awesome. So yeah, just so you get a feel for the interior, guys. I've got to sort this stereo out, but I love the retro feel. I actually really like this tan leather as well, and this but this combination of colours in here. I know lots of you are saying you'd much rather have black. I don't know. I just like it. I don't feel like I need to replace it, and it'd be too much work to do that anyway. My headliner is now sorted out, and I am driving on beautiful roads just around the Goodwood area in Chichester. Um, and I'm going to take, I'm going to hang a left here. Give that a little polish. Get that back on the end. Right, right traction control off. Okay. Come on. Let's let these guys go. That's why I like a rear wheel drive. <laughs> I'm not trying to upset any of anyone that says that, because I know that we've got all different kind of petrol heads and lots of great cars out there that are four wheel drive and front wheel drive, and they can still be great fun. But I need, I want to feel that power from the back, because that, that means you can have fun with the car when you're pulling out of junctions or when you're on a track and that sort of stuff, which is really important to me. BMW seem to be going the way now of the four-wheel drive with this new X-Drive system that they're putting in their latest cars. And the, they have to do it, don't they? Because we are in the era, as you've heard me say before, of the YouTube, <laughs> the YouTube reviews have probably become more influential than uh, the TV reviews and the magazines now. And the YouTube reviews is typically put these cars side by side on the runway, do 0 to 60s with them, see which one's the fastest off the line and which one stops the quickest. And that's going to influence the maximum amount of people in the shortest amount of time, which is what the mass market seems to respond to. And the car manufacturers are probably sitting there watching this thinking, Jesus, we've got to, we've got to win these 0 to 60 things with our, with our competition, you know. And if we don't, we're dead in the water. So it's like an arms race to find the, the best dragster car, you know, the big, best drag racing car off the line. And I do not want that. And I, I understand BMW have to play that game, but um, I'm not interested in that game, that arms race. And back in this generation of, of car, they were discovering how to build more power in the car. I think they got the balance right. The build quality decent back then. The styling, amazing, because these cars look beautiful. Um, but now they've figured out how to put performance in the cars. Um, now it's just got a little bit ridiculous for me, and it's a different generation of people, a different generation of petrol heads growing up today than, than like it was sort of back when I was a boy. <laughs> you know, we were buying like 100 quid cars as your first car to cars, and, you would do all the work yourself because you took it to the garage. Your first moment of learning about cars was when something goes wrong. It would be like 400 quid to fix it. You'd be like, what? And you'd do it, you'd end up doing it yourself with the Haynes manual. 
or your mate who was a mechanic who was half decent, you know, he wasn't really a mechanic, and you'll just do everything then because you didn't have the money. Now you've got kids coming out of school and, um, you know, stepping straight into A35s or A45s, BMW 140s, M140s, you know, um, S3s, RS3s, high performance cars on PCP where you can buy them for like four grand down and 500 a month or whatever. And um, it's a different generation now. You know, we, we, we just didn't have that sort of money to, to buy those sorts of cars. Um, so you bought a very cheap second-hand car when you started. And I think some of that, some of that has stuck with me that I've never really felt the need to, uh, well, be careful. Never really felt the need to have the latest and newest car because I get so much enjoyment out of these old, uh, these old, these old classics, if you like. It's not quite a classic, is it? It's not 25 years, but you know what I mean. Okay, guys, a final summary of the BMW E36 328i Sport. This car is going to carry on going up in value. And it's going to get rarer and rarer as less of them are on the road because it is it's a labor of love maintaining all the little niggles that you're going to get with them that being said this car captures a lot of the things the simple things about driving which are enjoyable going through the rev range enjoying the gear change the handling the cornering the big beefy six cylinder engine uh, and the nice styling this car again it's a cliche I love being inside it, it's a nice place to be. It makes me feel like I'm back at the sort of end of the 90s and the turn of the millennium when this car was actually produced and sold. That wasn't a bad time. I tell you, the roads were more like this and you could enjoy these simple but elegant cars a lot more. Woohoo! Okay guys, so now we're on to the E46 330 CI, or this Club Sport Edition CI, which is essentially the same with the spoiler, some alloy wheels, different paint job, and some little other limited edition features. Now let's start with price. I paid 2,000 pounds for this Club Sport, which is about as cheap as it gets for a manual one. Okay, it's a bit of a high miler, although the engine is a solid workhorse. We'll talk about that a, bit, a, li a little bit later on. You could pick up non-Club Sport 330 CIs. I've seen a few go for sub 1,000 pounds that weren't half bad. Uh, but typically for a decent one, I think you're gonna pay at least two and a half up to 4,000, and even in excess of 4,000, 4,000 for some low mileage ones. Everyone wants the, the hard tops, everyone wants the manuals, or not, not everyone, but you know what I'm saying. If you're if you're looking for one, a driver's car, then you're gonna get the manual. The point is that these, these E46s, 330Ci's, are actually a little bit cheaper now than the E36 328i Sport. In fact, this is one of the most bargain performance coupes that you can get and this car is also a wicked car to sling around a track as you've seen for anyone that follows the channel so the e46 wins on price next thing power this car has the m54 engine which is not without its niggles but most of the niggles around the the kind of the vacuum system on the top of the engine and leaks um, the, the strange CCV system, the strange uh, diesel valve, all these little these little strange quirks the engine has. But essentially, this inline six-cylinder engine is a real solid workhorse. And if you keep changing the oils on these cars, you can use and abuse them, and the engine will go. It wouldn't. It won't, sorry, the engine will never go. It'll be the rest of the car that rots away, but the engine will still be there revving like a heart beating away that's been extracted from a corpse <laughs> what the hell okay so the m54 engine is very cool that is one of the biggest differences between the e36 328i m52 engine and the m54 the accelerator pedal and the throttle response 
The accelerator pedal is lighter. The revs are more free flowing. They don't dip off so much when you come off the accelerator pedal. But it's the fact that you don't have a stiff accelerator pedal which makes a hell of a difference and makes the car slightly easier to drive over its E36 counterpart. God, there's some weird people. <laughs> what the hell's going on? It's like a little exercise day or something here. So what I want to do is just show you a little pull with the engine as well, so you can experience it. Uh, and we're going to stick to the speed limits as well, I'm just taking this off my head. So here we go. Oh, I've got to change gear. <laughs> I'm not flat out here actually either. I'm just going to, yeah, I'll come off, you get an idea. So let's stick that back on my head. Now the key thing is that this M54 engine for me has a much quicker, much more alive and alert throttle response than the E36 M328i Sport <laughs> with the M52 engine. And the biggest thing as well as that sort of more free flowing um, revs is that the accelerator pedal is a lot lighter so you can sort of it's a bit less hardcore driving the E36. It's a really heavy pedal and it takes some getting used to and it's tiring. So this, this just feels a bit nicer to accelerate on. It's an important part. Um, the engine has more power, about 40 extra horsepower over the, the M52 engine and that shows as well. And it just feels like when you're hammering it and you're on it, that you're in a much faster car than the E36 equivalent, if you like. So the M54 engine, for me, wins. And one bonus about this engine is it's a solid, the actual core engine is as solid as a rock. Yes, there's a lot of peripherals around it, um, you know, with the Vanos system, with the Deesa on the air intake, the vacuum leaks can be common, and, and misfires associated with vacuum leaks. But they're all niggles. The actual six-cylinder engine is as solid as a rock. And to cite Regis 330Ci, you know, he did 100,000 miles of track abuse and got that car up to, I think, 235,000 miles. And the engine was fine. And that car is still going. He sold it to someone else. So the engines are absolutely brilliant. But in summary, the, e the E46 wins the battle of the engines and the, the revability. There's a new word for you. God, the camera's gone dark. What's going on with the exposure? Okay, let's talk about the interior, guys. I've got a beefier steering wheel, first of all, with all the controls on it, which is nice. Slightly beefier dials. Lovely instrument cluster that I really, really like. I've got a TV here as well. How many two grand cars come with a TV? That's kind of cool. Everything feels like it's in the right place on this car, and I actually prefer having the little window controls here in the middle, not on the door. You just, once you get used to it, I think it's so much better. This interior now, even for a 20 year old car, I don't feel like it's that much different to when I get into a modern car. In fact, I think the design on some of the modern cars, I don't know, it's a bit kind of space age and a bit computery and uh, I'm not so sure about it. I can spot the kind of cheaper components. Now, it still has plastics in it, but it just doesn't feel cheap. So I think they've done a good job. There are less niggles on the interior on the e E46 as well. You get less problems with like the headlining sagging. It can happen, but it's less common. The door cards don't fall apart when you take them off, those little plastic pockets which shatter. Um, there are some things which are worse on the E46. These little bits of rubber plastic coating on, the, on these pieces here, they heat up and delaminate and just come off. That's really bad. And the E36 didn't have that problem. So they went forward a generation and actually created a problem with the trim. And that is a real problem on these cars. And it's expensive to replace it all. And I have replaced it on this car. So there, there's one thing that's better. Overall though, guys, it's the space and the sort of extra kind of mod cons that I think you get on this particular car. Going on interiors, which one is the best, the E36 or the E46? It's the E46. So next up guys, steering and handling, I guess. The main difference on this car is you get a beefier steering wheel. I think it might be slightly smaller as well, but the rack is quicker and it's slightly lighter, this hydraulic rack at lower speeds than the E36. And again, that just makes it a little bit less work 
to kind of control the car and steer the car. It looks a bit stiffer on the E36. Um, but primarily it's that quicker rack which does make a difference, especially around when you're driving around town. The E36 can feel a little bit like you're driving a lorry with the big wheel and the slower rack. At faster speeds, it doesn't matter so much. But if I had to say which steering feel do I prefer on both cars, it's the E46. Okay guys, hopefully you can see a little bit better now. Oh, oh. Jesus. <laughs> Hopefully you can see a bit better now. Suspension, I'm running absolutely bulk standard stock suspension on my E46, and I really like that suspension for normal UK roads. In other words, cross country. Because the roads here are, let's face it, bumpy, unpredictable, poorly maintained, all that sort of stuff. And I find the suspension is just about right so that when you do get a half decent bit of road, it's not too soft but when you've got a horrible bumpy road, it can take it. There is, however, a little bit too much body roll on this car, and you notice it when you put the car around track, and when I was looking at the footage, following myself around the track, or Lewis filming following me around the track, the amount of body roll on the car is high, so I probably will stiffen this car up, maybe put the Bilstein B12 package on it and an anti-roll bar link upgrade, which is quite common, especially because I'm using this for track use. Um, I have non-standard um, suspension on my E36 and it's decent now, it's set up properly, but it's a little bit too brutal most of the time and just about get away with it. So I can't really compare the two guys because I don't have stock on my E36. <laughs> oh. Oh. That is just lovely. I mean, this car's got plenty of performance for normal kind of road use, hasn't it? And I've just noticed now I'm overexposed and I'm all white. <laughs> Bloody cameras, I've got to pull over again. <laughs> ah. And we're off again. Wow, I actually managed to stick that time. The tires must be warming up a little bit. Uh, yeah, and I have awful tyres on this. The rears are virtually gone. That's why I keep losing traction. The sumo humos on the back and the uh, BF Goodluck ditch finders. <laughs> Limited edition ditch finders on the front. I'm only joking, by the way. Um, right, next thing, exterior styling, guys. Well, I'll show you the overlays of the car. This is a personal thing, and you tend to, whatever car you own, you tend to start to appreciate the lines more of the car the longer you own own it. Now with the E46 it's a game of three halves, front, side, rear. I think the car looks incredible from the rear, the E46, just like a really nice rear end on it. Check out the arse on that. <laughs> and from the side profile as well I think the car looks lovely. And the only criticism I have of is some, from, from the front sometimes like the, the bonnet as it moves into, as it sort of folds over in that central section where the grills are and the curves where the lines are, looks a bit too Art Deco for me sometimes. And I've lost the exposure again. Come back, there we go. <laughs> so yeah, but all in all, I think the E46 Coupe is a lovely looking car, but I'm gonna give it the looks department to the E36, as I'll talk about when I drive that car. Okay. Another pit stop to adjust the exposure on the camera. It looks all right for the time being. Next up, general ownership and like costs and niggles and things that go wrong. Well, here's the thing. Both of these cars, E36 and E46, are a little bit prone at their age for, rear, for, for rusting in the arches. Rear boot lid on the E36 and below the boot lid on the E46 and under that bonnet, um, under the rear bumper, sorry, on the E46 is somewhere you want to check out. Okay guys, so owning them and niggles and stuff like that. Rust, both of these cars are prone to rust, the E36 and the E46 in the rear arches. The E36 is prone in the boot lid as well and under the front scuttle and other areas. Um, the E46 rear arches again and under that rear bumper you need to check for signs of rust and the front wings as well on both cars. So unfortunately that's something that you've just got to keep an eye on uh, and it's similar on both of them in terms of rust. In terms of other niggles, 
Now, both cars are not without their faults. I've said earlier on that the, the M54 engine is prone to lots of issues around, you know, vacuum leaks. Um, and there's so many little peripheral components on the engine which can fail and cause little niggle, niggles on the car. But nowadays, most of those issues are known about and documented. So you can actually support your own car and fix your own problems. And to a lesser extent, the same is true of the, um, the M52 engine and the E36, where already I've had a couple of intermittent um, issues with like hitting virtual rev limiters, something to do with the ASC system and gremlins that come and go and problems with the traction control systems and sensors and stuff like that. So both cars are prone to niggles, but essentially, if you maintain them generally, I think they're gonna be solid, especially the engines. You look after those engines and you keep on top of the rust and you should have trouble-free motoring, tr trouble-ish-free motoring with both cars and both cars have got the potential to last a long time. And in fact, you'll see lots of E46s and E36s on the road, perhaps more so than any other car of its type in terms of volume. So guys, a quick summary of all these little categories that I'm flying through off my little bit of paper. You know, the old Donkey Nuts production here. <laughs> About 80% of those seem to be going in favor of the E46. And I will say this, I will say this only once. <laughs> If it's about driving experience and which one's more pleasurable, <laughs> more pleasurable to drive, it's definitely the E46. It's just easier to drive, it's more spacious, it's, the controls are a bit lighter and you feel like you've got more control, especially on long journeys or when you're driving it hard. This definitely is the choice for the driver, the driver's car. But overall, guys, if I had to keep one of these two cars, I had to just dispose of one tomorrow, which one would I keep? So yes, guys, which one would I have of the two? It would be the 328i Sport E36. It's not about the value, and it's not about the drive. The 330ci E46 is a better driver's car than this. The throttle response is better, it revs freer, there's a bit more space in the cockpit. It feels, it feels more modern, the, the rack is quicker, the steering wheel's beefier, the throttle is, the throttle pedal is a big thing that's lighter, this is quite a stiff throttle pedal on this car. And I feel like I can, I could just abuse the E46 on a track all day long, and I do, and it'll be fine. This car is not quite, it's not quite as, an easy driver's car to live with. Everything's a bit tighter, everything's a bit more restricted, everything's a bit smaller, everything's a bit more clunky, everything's a little bit older and a little bit more old fashioned. But the two things that edge it for me is that it's not all about, it's not all about the drive, which sounds a bit crazy, or else you'd be driving a modern car, wouldn't you? Because you'd still get a lot of niggles with the 330Ci. It's about how the car makes you feel and how it excites you and which one you want to drive more, which one I feel is more impressive, you know, even looking in on the outside. This turns a lot more heads, this car. The styling of it now, <laughs> it's beautifully styled. It's a retro looking car with quite sharp lines, but I think it looks aggressive. I think the, the, the way it flows, especially the rear quarter of the car is beautiful. It's, it's just a lovely looking car, even more so than the E30, the E46, especially at the front. The front design for me, the face, if you like, looks lovely. So yeah, it's that little bit of nostalgia, guys. The, the interior design is even a little bit older and retro. You feel like it's more of an experience getting in the E36 and driving it and owning it, even though there are some pains getting parts and you know, maintaining the car, but that's what it's all about. If you, if you, if you buy a 22 year old car and think it's just gonna be like driving around in a modern car, you're gonna be disappointed. You know, you're gonna need a good garage. You're gonna perhaps wanna be doing as many little jobs as you can yourself to replace things on the car and keep it all nice and keep on top of the rust. But for those little things that you do yourself, you get an attachment to the car that you don't get with a modern car where you just take it to the dealership to do all those things because you don't really understand the car and there isn't that knowledge of maintaining them yourself. So 
the E36 328 i Sport is a fantastic car to buy as both an investment, as something that's relatively cheap at the moment, and something which is giving you the full experience of owning a mature lady of a car, if not a full on classic. So that's my review guys. Uh, and of course, someone else could drive both these cars and conclude that the E46 330Ci is the one to go for. Don't get me wrong, I love them both or I wouldn't own them, but I'm just forcing myself to pick one and this would be the one that I would have. Thanks for watching. See you soon on the Forensics Detail channel. Where was I when